All right, Craig, am I good to go? Fantastic. Hello, everybody. The sun is just shining through the window just in time. It's really, really good to be here. And thanks for that great lead in, Craig. Okay, so since this conference was announced six months ago, I've been on a journey inside myself and back out again. So I want to start off for, with a big thanks for even the idea of the next two days. And I just want to say that you've probably noticed already that my slides and me are not aligned. This is deliberate. I find it really freeing. Don't have to worry about knocking them on. So the slides will rotate and I'll talk and you hopefully will let your thoughts go wherever they need. Like many people here, I didn't know that I was working class until I went into an environment where people treated me as though I was less important than them based on where I came from. Actually, on the contrary, I've been accustomed to thinking of myself as being quite privileged because although my dad, um, he was a plumber, he was a real grafter, he was permanently out of legitimate work by the time I went to uni in 1984. Still, we didn't live in the kind of abject poverty I saw around me sometimes in early 80s South Yorkshire. But I failed my honours degree and that crushed, crushed my aspirations for the next 10 years. It wasn't until I had my son Fraser, who's here um, and who's speaking tomorrow, which is so exciting. Um, it wasn't until I had him when I was 30 that I started to believe I could have some influence on the world. And that's when I found my drive. But this presentation isn't about me. And at the same time, it's inevitably about the way my life has colored the work that I do. So I want to be clear. I am all about how joyful it is to be working class. I've never ever thought anything different. I work in further education, so that might be a slightly different context to some of you. And further education is absolutely a working class service, as my friend Rania Harper says. And we don't talk about that. We just don't talk about it, it's never mentioned. We don't talk about the fact that black and brown and white working class people make up the bulk of our students, that many of us are you know, neurodivergent as well, that many of us are also teachers, but black, brown, white working class people are hardly ever our leaders. We treat people, staff and students in a fee like battery hens, which if you think about it is a fine, preparation for a life working in places like Amazon Warehouse because after all the Education Secretary Gabby and Williamson said last week the main purpose of education is to get a job you know any job so I've educated myself out of having a job like my dad in the early 80s I found that the only way I can actually be me and talk about being me is by working for myself though I have to say that I do eventually pay my taxes I both jumped and I was pushed from nearly a 20 year career in an FE college. I jumped because I liberated myself through European philosophy. Just bear with me. I know that sounds a bit bizarre. Just bear with me. And I was pushed because eventually I was just too much by myself, by which I mean, I wasn't content just to be working class, letting middle class colleagues leap over me with my own ideas. I started to talk about being working class as well. So have you ever found that in academia or in public service? It's okay to be working class. Actually, it's quite acceptable as long as you don't talk about it, as long as you don't get, you know, beyond your station. So it's cool to be around us, isn't it? It's cool to, you know, feel part of that because we are cool. But it, it's not okay to talk about, to be difficult about it. So I want to talk to you today about how doing a PhD, and I'm just finishing, just coming to the end of my six years, self-funded, at Huddersfield Uni, but it has really liberated me to think differently about what FE can be. At Huddersfield, I've got to say it's okay to be a working class PhD student, though I do have to say it's a bit more awkward to be a working class person who rejects Marxism, and I've, I've come to reject Marxism in the course of learning how to think on the PhD. My frame is post-humanism, and even as, right, I'm starting to tell you that the genealogy of post-humanism comes from the Enlightenment Dutch philosopher Spinoza, via Deleuze and Guattari and Paris 1968, and I feel a complete dick even saying those words. I always do. Even though that's how I live my life, I always feel that. You can take the girl out of Mexico, etc. 
But what post-humanism does is it allows me to lift up that huge, sorry, I don't know, put my notes up there, that huge crinoline of social construct that we labour under and take a glimpse of what's really there, humans and the non-human world that's all around us. So don't worry, I'm not going all lives matter. Very clear that some lives matter more than others. And at the core of post-human thinking, and you'll see him keep popping around there, is Vitruvian Man. So he was elevated in Enlightenment times to become the perfect human, the David Beckham of his day. And, and that's in a way the biggest crinoline of all, that concept of what human is. It's internalized in all of us, black, white, and brown man and woman you know it's in turn it's in there this is perfect vitruvian man formed the theoretical base for colonialism for the other in of anyone around us who isn't as white as male as whole and of course i put apostrophes around that as privileged as he is 250 years after this the philosopher simone bignall wrote that the further away we are from vitruvian man the nearer we are to death in this global Anthropocene, this time when humans have done so much damage that the earth won't recover. Now we like to think, all of us, that education can transform lives and there's enough truth in that to make the exception seem the rule, <clears throat> but it's not the rule. Where I used to work there was a culture of gratitude which actually obscured how many people actually slipped through the net and much of FE is the same despite the best efforts of individuals because it's the structure. Education can't make you more white, more male, more straight, more straight, and nor should it of course. So in the world that we live in, it can't make enough of us more equal for it to make a difference. Not how it is now, not how it stands. What the Enlightenment set up, what Descartes and others set up was a monument that holds us all in thrall. And that's the monument of the binary. For God's sake, it's even how computers work. Our challenge is not just to end the struggles of inequality, but the structures that cause those struggles. And our wholesale acceptance of binaries is one of those structures, if not the fundamental one. Ourselves versus other, mind versus body, man versus woman, black versus white, straight versus queer, middle class versus working class. When I take up my post-human lens, I've got half a chance of seeing past those binaries, that monument and the documents that support it. But there are other documents, documents like what I choose to wear, what I choose to eat, what I choose to drink, what I choose to do with my free time. I want to be very clear that I am not less working class because I enjoy an avocado salad with my glass of red wine. I'm working class because that's been the experience of my life and it's an experience that still shapes how I think and act. I have a lovely life and I'm just as working class as I ever was. I'm working class because, and you'll see this flash around as well, as Dee Hunter says, I constantly commit acts of solidarity with my class and against the systems that seek to divide us. And that's the heart of it for me. I'm working class by experience and also as a practice, as an affirmative practice. Not Monty Python's for Yorkshiremen, but connecting, uplifting and affirming working class thinkers as a practice. And that's why the people who give me grief on Twitter for how unhelpful it is to mention class, even if our grandparents, our parents or even ourselves shared a working class experience growing up, they can't shift me because they choose not to practice working class solidarity anymore. And that's their choice. I choose to build my career around it. Since 2017, I've been a nomad, which is a pure Deleuzean concept. And again, I'm sounding like a dick. I totally know I am. As a nomad, I work for myself on various projects. I'm never completely alone. And I'm always with a constellation of others. Constellations which are time bound, coming together as we do around shared ideas and energy for the life of the project and then dispersing, getting onto different things. Not a team that gets, sticks around and gets fed up with one another. By not being employed, I'm not owned and I can walk away and I have walked away if work diverges from my values. 
I make my decisions based on a personal affirmative ethics, which is very live in me and which I revisit at least daily. Sometimes I get paid, sometimes I don't. It's cool, there's enough. And I swerve any attempts to territorialize me. I won't be infantilized, so there's no line management for me. These lines of flight are freeing up the best work I've ever done. And I came to all of this through doing my PhD because it switched me on to thinking. Because before that, as a working class person, even a really bolshy one, I've been conditioned not to think, or at least not to think for myself. I've been conditioned by the left as well as the controlling hegemony of the right. So I had to step out of all of that. My fight now is for equality. My work is always for equality. And the value that most drives me is joy. Spinoza's notion of joy, which is relational, all about the connections between people, the energy that comes from that. Joy as a practice, working class solidarity as a practice. What a combination. It's absolutely what we need in the world. Anyway, as this joyful, nomad, anarchist type person, I get to talk to loads of people across the whole of FE and I've come to realise that the work I'm doing with others is to open up spaces where ideas can flourish, where people can flourish. Spaces which always begin with the humanising question, how are you? Not the siloed crinoline of who are you? As my friend Steph Wilkinson says, I'm always asking what matters to you. In the chat, um, dead early on, um, I think while Kit was talking, Louisa said, you know, where do we get taught to network as working class people? And I realized I think that's what I do, yeah? That not just, I'm not gonna exclude you if you don't identify as working class, but that's what I do. So lockdown has accelerated the work and we've got a real moment now to change the culture of FE so that the nonsense of othering, of disowning, of infantilizing, of patronizing is transformed. We've got a moment because we've learned to work in this way and we've got a moment because there's gonna be money. And if we can make the case powerfully enough for an affirmatively joyful way of working, that money might create some space rather than considering, continuing the misery of academia. Three examples then, three practical examples of what is actually changing further education. First of all, the ideas rooms. These are facilitated in a thinking environment, which is a practice of equality, where role, rank and ego are left at the door and individuals are empowered to think for themselves while remaining fully present as themselves in all their identities. So it's genuinely intersectional work. If your mind is drifting now to unicorns and rainbows, just stop, please, because this is a real disciplined practice. And that's why the power people resent it. The ideas generated here are already shifting stubborn cultures across their feet. Number two, practical, Joy FE. Look at the hashtag Joy FE. This is a constellation of educators who have come together since lockdown to remake a joyful education. Broadcast, magazine, a podcast series, a manifesto, a message, a movement, a new leadership. And here's a challenge. Funnily enough, we're all women. Men don't seem drawn to us. I don't know what that's about. Is it the unicorns? Is it the rainbows? But we are, you know, we are efficient. I'll just leave that there. And then thirdly... Yeah, just, just about two, three minutes, Luke. Yeah, that's cool. Nearly done, Craig. Thirdly, the solidarity thinking spaces, which are directly relevant from here. So check out hashtag solidarity space. What a lifeline. This is a bi-weekly space facilitated in a thinking environment, which is determined to create a new narrative. And it's also a place just for working class people to be, to be together, to think together. The last adventure challenged my post-human thinking, as do those middle-class people on my timeline just about every day. If I'm all about changing culture through affirmative politics, turning anger into joy, why is it helpful to stay in these places of pain? I felt driven to open up the first solidarity thinking space because someone I loved was in pain. I was driven by feelings and intuition. How are you? What matters to you? rather than philosophy on this occasion, but the thinking has followed. Every one of those sessions ends up in a more affirmative, more activist space than it began. So knock yourself out, haters. As long as working class people in any community across any intersection 
are work hurting because of how they are treated by the man, by the monument, we'll keep opening up these spaces to find one another. We'll keep practicing working class solidarity. We'll keep practicing joy. We'll channel that anger into joyful militancy and we'll change the working class service of Epi and so much more besides. Thank you for listening. Done. Excellent, great, that, that was fabulous, Lou. Uh, and, and there's been a, a kind of hive of activity uh, taking place as you've been speaking. Uh, so th there's lots of questions um, and we've got, I'm just gonna reset my clock, so just bear with me a second. Your comments uh, around um, being liberated of line management uh, uh, seem to provoke a lot of uh, <laughs> many, many responses. <laughs> Um, now, so I've kind of teased out for a few comments. So, have you ever had a good <laughs> line manager, um, or, or is, is it a kind of category of organisational sort of necessity that, that is unnecessary? Do you think? Um, I don't believe it's necessary, and I think um, I think rather than personalise it, it's the, it's the institution that's that's it's the hierarchy, isn't it? It's the infantilisation of, and the, you know, the thing that always got me was if you want a day off. Be sure, you know, if you want to go to a conference, be sure to get your line manager's permission. Fuck off. <laughs> you know, that, that to me is the only natural response. Now, what I have now, Craig, in my nomad role, I do a lot of work with Touch Consulting and Joss Can, who runs Touch Consulting. She's a project manager. So I absolutely deliver what Joss asks me to deliver. But mm -hmm. she doesn't try and manage me. She manages the whole work of which I am a part. If yeah. we could do that, then that would make a real difference. Because treat me like a kid. I promise you, I'll act like a teenager. And I do. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So now, now, picking up on the, uh, another term that you used generated a lot of comments and questions. And that's nomadism. Um, so the... Uh, one question that, that cropped up, uh, and, and if you can kind of speak to this and, and kind of tease out the distinction. Uh, so one question focused on, is it, are you nomadic or are you precarious? Is it nomadism or is it precarity? You know, the, you know it sounds wonderful in one sense, but surely there's kind of challenges, etc. Yeah, massively. I mean, I mean, look at now. You know, my work just stopped, as many people's work just stopped. I did get that payout from the government, and, and that's cool, you know, but... Um, yeah, it is precarious. Um, it's, it's a positive choice. I think one of the things I, I want to say is, I want to say two things. One is, I had no savings when I made this decision. So and I've never had any savings. And this, and I, I'm on my own, and I've got a son. And, you know, so it wasn't an easy decision to make financially in this world that we're in. There wasn't financial privilege there to help me make it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. I want to say that nothing is more frightening than the power line managers and others have to take your salary away. That's yeah. what I want to say. So I know now if, if I'm skinned, then I can go work a few shifts in the pub or, you know, do all sorts of things I can do. I've got lots of skills actually. Um, the reason I haven't yet had to do that is because I have worked so hard at my networks and I don't think it is possible to be a nomad in this day and age without putting the graft in to building really genuine and reciprocal networks and that's back to the joy of connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because kind of link, linked into that and I just made a note from another of the questions. It, it's quite clear that your approach to nomadism in that sense it's not just a purely academic uh, sort of initiative, is it? You, you kind of translate it into your everyday life. It's, yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of part of, of who you are in kind of everything that you do. Yeah, yeah, and it spins around that ethics that I have to make my own ethics. As soon as you work for an organisation, you've got, you've got a competing ethics, haven't you? You've got their staff conduct or whatever it is. So, so I'm always walking my boundaries every day. It, it's on me, yeah, you know, good or bad. Okay, there was a few kind of recognitions and acknowledgements uh, about you self-funding your PhD uh, and, and also the kind of the, the age that you're at in doing it, which so it resonated positively with quite a number of people. Uh, so a question relating to that, and, and, and it kind of, again, links into your notion of nomadism um, in relation to your PhD and your studies. Do you feel at home uh, in any way in academia, in doing the PhD, 
um, you know, is there any sense of belonging in that sense or, or not? It's complex because I, did, I, I ran a University of Huddersfield programme at Northern College. So when I started on the PhD, which was an EDD, I actually started alongside colleagues, if that makes sense. So even though I haven't done that for three years, the, 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 the remnants of those relationships have carried forward. So there is a sense of belonging, but it's to people, I think, rather than the institution. I've got great supervisor, a pair of supervisors, and great support amongst people that, that are there. The institution is so excluding of me. I mean, that, you know, that 12 grand is still sat on my credit card. Yeah. And I had, I had a, I'm finishing this year because I can't afford to pay for another. And I had a massive fight last year when I was not allowed to pay in installments. So it had to go back on the credit card again. So that again, that the institution, the monument of academia is not supportive at all. But when I think about the friends I have within academia, present company included, you know, I've found a space in that. Nobody ever makes me feel less than. Mm -hmm. The only place it shows up is when you know if I'm speaking at a conference and people change my job title and they say something like independent researcher I'm a nomad that's what I am that's what I wrote on my <laughs> form don't change what it says on the tin so it's again it's the documents and monuments it's not the people 